So it's that time of year again, time for the 2022 Winter Olympics. And the Winter Olympics are something that I indeed know of. But this year, it seems like there's been so much controversy related to it that it's hard to ignore. Like, there's just so much going on. Sportsmanship and athleticism is nice, but there's a lot of controversy surrounding the 2022 Winter Olympics. It's worth remembering that while Western countries may be boycotting these Olympics over human rights issues. Uh, but we'll get to all that. For now, though, enjoy the opening ceremony. Because holy shit, that looks wild. But don't get too comfortable because it's time for controversy number one. The tons of artificial snow that was created for this. Yeah, the first time ever, the Winter Olympics have now been hosted with 100% artificial snow, which is pretty crazy. Not only that, though, I mean, let's say it's luxury snow, because although Beijing's official budget for hosting the Olympics was $3.9 billion, the actual cost has been 10 times that, at $38.5 billion. Not only is that a huge financial cost, but that's a huge environmental one, too. What happens when you hold a Winter Olympics in a metropolis with hardly any naturally occurring snow? Scientists say it's an environmental sin, especially considering this was a nature reserve. So because climate change has shrinked the number of countries that can hold the event, fake snow becomes necessary, and thus it starts to accelerate said climate change. Beijing is winning Olympic gold in climate crisis acceleration because that's only the tip of the fake snow iceberg when it also comes to controversy. I think instead of going into all of that right now, let's look at Sean. No! He's a familiar face, and we might as well start there. And he's competing for the last time. I just see him as the Tony Hawk of snow. There's a number of video games about him. Even one of them I remember playing. He's also known as the Flying Tomato. Except the likes of Louis Vita. That's his nickname. Uh, people love the red hair. I guess that's what they came up with. He's an idol. Everyone loves him. He's, you know, whatever. But he's extremely old at the age of 35. So this would be his last games. Okay, they have this machine here that, like, just knows who you are. Like, it, it pulls up your picture right here. You wear a hat, you wear the mask, everything. It still knows it's you. I'm going to try to trick it, see how I go. All right, let's see if we can trick the machine. Oh, got me! How does it know? At one point, Sean hugging Ayumo Hirano went viral and made everybody cry. And this is a good time to get into the, another controversy, this time with the snowboarding world of the Olympics this year. Apparently, the judges don't know how to judge. And it's the snowboarders themselves who are pissed off at the awful judging and scoring. Ayumu Hirano's second run really illustrates the confusion. Ayumu Hirano is from another planet. It's over. It's done. No one will touch that run tonight. No one will touch that run. 91.75 ooh. What? What? Is there a mistake? How did? There's no way. Hirano landed a triple cork, which is apparently one of the most challenging tricks in the sport, and one that's never been performed as part of a complete run. And he just got killed on points. The other big controversy involved Max Parrott, who is following a comeback from cancer, and he won gold in snowboarding slopeside which is great, you know, beat cancer, win gold, you know, whatever. But he grabbed his knee during a trick instead of the board, but that wasn't caught. It should have been an automatic loss of points for not completing the key maneuver, but it was clearly able to be seen with a different video angle as well as some slow motion. The fact that the judges didn't catch it is a huge problem, though, you know, and athletes, of course, are also pissy because, hey, he probably shouldn't have gotten that. I mean, it changes scores. It, you know, it's a very indeed a life changing problem. And snowboarders are outraged and asking why there isn't proper display for the judges, as well as just better standards for the judging being done. Thankfully for Hano, he outdid himself on his third run, and he did get gold, as he deserves, but if he didn't, there would have been a huge nightmare of a problem if the judges left it at that. Like, holy shit. I recently watched the docuseries called Meddling, 
which was about the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympic pair's figure skating scandal. It was alleged there was a fixed game where the Russian pair received gold for a stiff performance, which also included a minor flub, and the Canadian pair, who were seen as the clear winners in the eyes of everyone after they performed their love story skate, didn't win. They got silver. The judges gave gold to the ju Russian pair. There was absolute outrage, and things tumbled ev extremely quickly into this scandal of, hey, uh, there's some games like being fixed. There's deals going on behind the scenes. It's beautiful, it's difficult, and it does indeed feel like the Cold War. There's a lot to unpack in the world of figure skating. Beijing is now included. Before that, though, because there's a lot, let's look at China's star celebrity and Olympic idol Eileen Gu, as well as other Asian Americans who are competing and the reactions of it. People like Nathan Shen, Chloe Kim, and Zhu Yi. Eileen Gu is a freestyle skier and model. She is insanely popular in China, dubbed the Snow Princess or the Frog Princess as well, after she wore like a green helmet. The Chinese are pretty good at nicknames. Free skiing, I mean, that's an extreme sport. Can you tell us a bit what it is? Because I think not everyone around the globe really knows what that discipline really is. It's pretty much like gymnastics. Um, on skis, you're doing flips, you're doing spins. Um, there's a half pipe, which is shaped like this, and you jump out and back in. And then there's another discipline called slope style, which is jumps and rails. And then finally, the last discipline is called big air, which is just one big jump. She's among the list of foreign born athletes competing for China. She was born in San Francisco, California, to a Chinese mother and American father, and was raised in the United States. Today is the day. Today is December 11th, and for those of you who don't know, that is the day that Stanford releases their restrictive early action um, decisions. So this is my dream school. It's the school that I have literally wanted to go to since I was six years old, and it's the only dream that I've had for longer than my dream of going to the Olympics. <laughs> But she changed her nationality to compete for China, which ignited an uproar for some Americans who see it as being kind of a traitor, ungrateful, and so on. Well, Eileen did it. She has become an Olympic champion and brought a prestigious gold medal to the People's Republic of China. However, this is where things start to get interesting, as inevitably there was going to be some major criticism going towards Eileen. Even before she won the gold medal, Fox News reporters Tucker Carlson and Will Kane described Eileen as ungrateful for betraying and turning her back to the country that raised her and calling her decision to represent China shameful. Uh, she says cry about it. I mean, kind of agree. Like, let her, leave her alone, whatever. She does her job juggling her American and Chinese roots. She's also very fluent in Mandarin and it flows really naturally. <laughs> <laughs> she spent a lot of time in China growing up as well, but she did have a little bit of a Marie Antoinette moment when asked on Instagram, why can you use Instagram and millions of Chinese people from the mainland cannot? Why you get such special treatment as a Chinese citizen? That's not fair. Can you speak up for the millions of Chinese who don't have internet freedom? And Gu replied, anyone could download a VPN, it's literally free from the app store. China does not have free flow of information. Apps like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Google, and Wikipedia are all blocked. That's something most of China has to deal with. But Gu looked a little clueless when she responded, and many pointed out that downloading an unauthorized VPN is illegal in China, and there can be a harsh punishment for trying to get around the firewall. A man in 2017 was sentenced to five years in jail for running a VPN. Literally, I'm not anyone. Literally, it's illegal for me to use a VPN. Literally, it's not f***ing free at all. Other than that, she's a pro. She's an idol, an icon. Everyone seems to love her. Contrast this with another Olympian who was also born in California, raised in America, and gave up her nationality to compete for China. Zi. She's 19, and she also found herself in a firestorm of online hate and criticism after falling flat on the ice and finishing last in the women's short program event, team event, Olympic figure skater getting slammed on Chinese social media. 19-year-old Zhu Yi crushed, crashed rather, into a wall during Sunday's short program in the team event. The California native gave up her U.S. citizenship to compete for China at the Winter Games. China finished in fifth place after her performance, and Zhu Yi has fallen 
became the top trending topic on Weibo. That's the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. The hashtag Zui has fallen, gained 200 million views in a few hours on China's Twitter-like platform Weibo. On the, as the online hike continued, she was called a disgrace, an embarrassment, and people were furious that she was picked to represent China over a Chinese-born athlete. Rumors were flying that it was because of her father being a prominent scientist. People were upset that she didn't have a firm grasp on Mandarin yet. The girl felt upset and embarrassed, and you can tell how much pressure she was feeling to perform well for China, and she appeared to be absolutely destroyed. It didn't help that she fell the next day. She broke down in tears, and unfortunately, it only added to the online hate and criticism this young girl was receiving. There seemed to be a stark contrast between treatment of her and Gu. Many did come to her defense. She did have a lot of support. Days later, during her short program, she found support and encouragement. Chinese spectators cheered and applauded as she managed to stay standing following her combination jump that sent her crashing into the wall before. And she was able to smile in front of the camera when she finished. The hashtag Zuyi smiles immediately trended on Chinese social media. She had her own little redemption skate and was able to feel a little happier afterward. And that's wonderful to see. Okay, I need another inspiring story. So let's talk about Chen number three. That's the nickname for Nathan Chen in China. There were a few other Chens and that's why they call him that. <laughs> it's kind of fun. His other nickname though is the Quad King. Can you guess why? He does a lot of quadruple jumps in competitions and he does so with such ease. And so yeah, he's damn good. He's best of the best. And he was four years ago too. Everyone assumed already that he was going to get gold in 2018, but then he didn't. Obviously, Olympic athletes perform under extremely tense pressure and nerves and everything. There's a possibility of falling victim to it if you don't have the right mindset or your headspace. That's why mental health is pretty important. We can touch on that later. But his hopes were no more. At the time, Chen was 18 and everything had gotten too big. He was nervous, worried, uncertain of what to do, overwhelmed by the expectations. A sense of dread. He says of how he felt what he learned he was going to the Olympics that year. I feel for Chen. He was feeling fear and, you know, dread <laughs> rather than joy. He's talked about the fear he felt back then. But in 2022, thankfully, he, he's back. He found a way to not feel fearful about the Beijing Olympics, but rather joy from a place of passion for figure skating. Because that's all it is. With confident Chen back, all eyes were on him, with the hope that he could win gold this time. And boy, did he deliver. It was incredible to watch, because not only does he have the skills and the flow, it just felt like he was having the time of his life out there. You could see it. There was no fear. It was just happiness and just love for what he was doing. And so he won gold. He did it. He redeemed himself. He praises his mom for all the help. You know, it's they've come so far. He also became the first Asian American man to earn an Olympic medal in men's figure skating singles. Way to go. But that's not the only medal he won. He helped to lead Team USA into a silver medal spot. He doesn't have the medal for it. None of them do. And it's due to the major main story of the Beijing Olympics, the big whammy of controversy, and a chance to sour the games more. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we have another Russian doping scandal, this time with a minor. So let's begin with this. You may have seen the flag for Team Russia, and you may say to yourself, huh, that's not Russia's flag. And you'd be correct, because that is instead not representing Russia, the country, but rather it's representing ROC. Those athletes are competing under the name of the Russian, Russian Olympic, Olympic Committee, Committee, or ROC. ROC for short. That's because Russia received a two-year ban from the World Anti-Doping Agency in 2019 for its state-sponsored doping program. Between December 17th, 2020 and December 17th, 2022, no athlete can represent Russia at the Olympics, Paralympics, or at World Championships. It was in 2016 that this got blown open by a whistleblower, and it included 15 medal winners from the 2014 Sochi Olympics. So the hammer came down on Russia, who was then suspended. You were bad. You're 
still bad right now. I don't want to talk about it. It's tragic. But Russian athletes spoke up and didn't want to be collectively punished when they didn't do anything wrong and they weren't part of that scheme. And so the Court of Arbitration for Sport did decide to let Russian athletes participate as neutral competitors representing the ROC, not Russia. The Russian flag is banned from being flown. The Russian national anthem can't be played if someone wins. Instead, it will just play Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto Number no. 1. They're on thin ice. One would think that this would send a message, but it didn't. They simply got better at getting away with it. Figure skating is something that Russia absolutely dominates in, and this hunger for achievement in it that comes with a high cost. Enter the villain of the story, Instant Noodle Sister. That's the Chinese nickname. She's formerly known as Eteri Tubretze. I hope I don't pronounce things too bad. She is a coach known for producing extremely young girls into champions who can do things that only their prepubescent bodies can do. They are trained intensely. They are pushed to the limits of what a body can handle in order to win. And then they get discarded once they turn around 16 because their bodies aren't able to do the things anymore. And you know, getting out of it in one piece is lucky because there's many examples of long lasting and devastating consequences from Russian figure skating and instant noodle sister herself. Her first eventual victim was Yulia Lipnitska. She's the little girl in the red dress who captured the attention of the world with her performance at the Sochi 2014 games. Again, Russia goes wild over figure skating. Putin loved her. National hero, honestly. A uh, noodle woman says, what I try and teach my students starting at about the age of 13 is that you can't just come up to practice and start whining. I am tired. I can't do this now. Let's do it tomorrow. Just look at the map and see the size of rock. And when you're selected and sent to an international competition, you will have a jacket. On its back, it will say rock. If you are supposed to be the best, the rock. Ascent for the world to see, then you cannot just step out onto the ice with a bad attitude, thinking I am tired today. I don't feel like skating my best and representing the rock people as they expect me to. So Yulia was celebrated at that time. No. But not many knew of her spiral that she found herself in afterwards. And she had a long-standing vicious battle with anorexia. Raman pushes her girls to do things no other woman would attempt. Quads. To pull off a quad, a skater must be in the air for at least 0.65 to 0.7 seconds. Within that minuscule amount of time, they must somehow complete four full rotations of their body, reaching rotational speeds of almost 500 RPM. If this wasn't hard enough, they also have to land gracefully while their body is generating immense force. In other words, a jump pushes the athlete to the extreme. He explained, In a quadruple jump, you are landing with seven times your body weight. That is a lot of force. When they fall on a jump like that, some say it feels like their intestines end up in their throat. And it's an expectation almost, now. Her philosophy is to train very young girls to do this while they still can. This also requires them to be as light as possible. Rather than training muscles, building strength, and sculpting a champion that will last, Spaghetti Hair relies on not letting her athletes drink water during the games. Daily weigh-ins. She was proud of the fact that Yulia could sustain herself on powdered nutrients only. The only tactic for landing insane feats is to have her skaters also rotate before leaving the ice. And that leads to injury. The oldest skater to successfully land a quad was 19 years old Elizabeth Tursimbaeva of Kazakhstan, also coached by Tuberidze, who retired with a career-ending back injury the following year. At this point, I think almost nobody is under the impression that adult women can jump quads without compromising their health and their longevity. Not only that, but it's quite apparent that, at least for now, grown women pretty much can't successfully jump a quad. Period. Yulia retired from figure skating at age 19 due to injuries and her long battle with a severe eating disorder. She's given up figure skating and doesn't plan to go back to it. She would have been pushed out anyway. 
likely due to the Eteri expiration date. These girls end their careers at ages 14, 16, 17, and so on. Every competition, there's a new girl who has replaced an old one. Their long-term health seems to have no consideration, or at least no care. It's a huge issue, and there really is a lot to it. If you're at all interested in this further, and want to know more about other Eteri girls... Um, and their stories. Check out videos by Fran on the state of figure skating. Now let's finally talk about Camila Valieva. She's a 15-year-old prodigy that's been referenced as being once-in-a-lifetime talent, if not the best female like figure skater in the world. She does it all, and she's Russia's star skater. February 7th was the team event where ROC placed first. Team USA got silver. Thank you, Chen3. Also, I just can't get over these creative nicknames. I like them. Soup God, Bucket of Scallion, wonderful choices. The Russian girls are collectively called dolls or babies. I apologize for derailing the topic into nicknames. Back to it, the Japanese team won bronze. That's that. On February 8th, it was announced that Valieva failed a drug test and tested positive for trimetrazidine. Damn. Trimetazidine is a, is a drug, it's, it's used to treat uh, angina and, and some other uh, heart-related heart conditions. And the way it works is it changes the way um, that the heart muscle um, uh, metabolizes or, or gains, its, gains its energy. Um, uh, and so uh, given that it can have, have that effect on, on a pretty important muscle in the body, um, I guess it could be used for import, uh, performance enhancing purposes. This is precisely what Vastarel MR does directly at the level of the cardiac cells. By partially inhibiting free fatty acid oxidation, Vaster LMR favors ATP synthesis via glucose oxidation, thus favoring a more efficient way to produce energy in ischemic conditions. This shift... This is something that derailed and consumed the Olympics for a number of reasons. And this child is at the center of it. Valieva actually had a total of three substances that would enhance function of the heart. Hypoxin and L-carnitine aren't banned like TMZ is, but it's still incredibly concerning. And it's concerning why they're in her body. She's a minor. No one seems to be enraged with Valieva herself. She's just a child, a victim of all of this. This sort of doping isn't done by her. It's done, allegedly, by the hands of her coach and higher-ups, and it's sad to see how they fail her. The sample that was being tested had been from December 25th, and it only came to light later on. Immediately following the announcement, the ROC went into damage control. Valieva was suspended and due for a hearing by the Court of Arbitration for Sport. What was the legal team's defense, you might ask? What could they think of? Something asinine. There can be completely different ways how it got into her body. For example, grandfather drank something from a glass, saliva got in, the glass was somehow later used by an athlete, or the drug lay down on some surface, chases remained, the drug lay down on this surface, which the athlete then drank. If this sounds ridiculous to you, that's because it is. Doctors say, it reminds me of kids I knew who said they got venereal disease from the toilet seat. TMZ is fast acting, and it doesn't stay in the body for too long either. It needs to be typically taken three times a day, uh, and then cleared out in like 24 hours. AKA, it is the ideal drug for doping, honestly. In, out, easy. Bottom line, she had a banned substance in her system, and this should have been the easiest decision to make. She can't participate. Those are the rules, you know? But instead, we got a curveball. Actually, the ad hoc division of the court has issued its decision in the procedures relating to the figure skater Camila Valieva. The cast panel in charge of this matter has decided to let Miss Valieva continue her participation in the Olympic Winter Games Beijing 2022. She was in a very special situation that the Olympic Games take place only every four years, and she would, if she would miss the competition at these games, uh, the damage could not be repaired. It's a, it's a damage which is irreparable, 
uh, and therefore they felt she must be uh, allowed to compete with the consequence that if at the end it's a doping case, she, she will lose the medal she has won. This wasn't the decision people wanted to hear. People, including former Olympians, are quite upset about that decision to allow her to compete. Uh, for example, let's bring up one reaction for you. This one from the American Olympian Tara Lipinski. She, of course, was the Olympic women's champion back in 1998. She writes, I strongly disagree with this decision. At the end of the day, there was a positive test, and there is no question in my mind that she should not be allowed to compete. We also have this from the South Korean uh, 2010 Olympic women's champion Kim Yuna, who on Instagram um, along with just a black image, she writes, athletes who violate doping cannot compete in the game. This principle must be observed without exception. All players' efforts and dreams are equally precious. We are disappointed by the message this decision sends. It is the collective responsibility of the entire Olympic community to protect the integrity of sport and to hold our athletes, coaches, and all involved to the highest of standards. Athletes have the right to know that they are competing on a level playing field. Unfortunately, today that right is being denied. This appears to be another chapter in the systematic and pervasive disregard for clean sport by Russia. Like, we thought drugs were bad and there's no place for them in competition. That's why, that's what we saw in 2020 when Shikari Richardson was barred from the Tokyo Games for testing positive for marijuana leading up to it. Of Flojo, is she a little bit of Gail Divas? Maybe. Some people have drawn that comparison. But she is 100% Shakari Richardson, and she wants everybody to know her name. The wind has died down. It's likely to be legally. So whatever that clock says is going to count. She ran a 10.64, win aided in the semi. Who's going to Tokyo? We're about to find out. <laughs> Women's 100 is underway. JVN Oliver. Fantastic start. She's putting the pressure on Richardson. Here comes Shakari. Richardson's going to Tokyo. 1087. She's one of the best. Everyone was excited to see her and gearing up to see her at the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. But a week prior to racing, she learned that her mother had died, and she talked about how it sent her into an emotional panic. She smoked pot, and it was legal where she lived. I don't blame her at all. I really don't think anybody was. No one would blame her, but, but she was hit with a suspension despite the fact that marijuana simply isn't in any way performance enhancing. And this is absurd, but she still did so gracefully with a heavy heart. We were all kind of heartbroken for her because it was kind of ridiculous. When she was allowed to continue skating, it truly brought outrage, not at her per se, but just for the decision, those higher ups, those who failed this whole thing those who allowed her to continue because even if she competed and won as she expected to there wouldn't even be a ceremony if she placed on the podium more athletes would be missing out on their olympic ceremony only because she was there she's a minor and thus a protected person which is the main factor in deciding to allow her to continue because she isn't directly responsible for this but it's all still kind of absurd I can't imagine what a 15-year-old Valieva was feeling as all of this played out. This is the most heartbreaking Olympics to ever watch, really. This awful storm culminated and consumed her into her free skate, which ended in disaster. She fell four times to everyone's surprise and concern and ended in tears. It was hard to watch. She did so poorly that she ended up placing fourth, not even reaching the podium which left everyone in shock, really. No one expected this, but it makes sense. Everyone around the world is watching this trauma unfold and the moment she steps off the ice, it's Harry is in her face asking, why did you stop fighting? Like, oh my God, this is awful. There's zero comfort or zero reassurance given to this poor girl. The unraveling of her teammate, Alexandra Trusova, has also been hard to watch. Following her skate, she was visibly breaking down and shouting in an outburst after she learned she only got second place despite her performance of an extremely impressive and intense routine that included five quad jumps. Somehow, it was her teammate Anna who won the gold. Despite it not being as impressive, 
but it seemed to show a little bit more artistry. Afterwards, Trusova exclaims that she hates this sport and that she will never go back on the ice again. She was the only one out of the entire Russian team to not receive a gold medal. I can only imagine how devastating that felt to her. Again, it's just heartbreaking. Anna couldn't even celebrate because she was also just feeling unhappy about all of this as well. I mean, the Russian team is just spiraling. It's awful. Watching these girls and all this unfold is terrible. Making the latter half of this video has just made me really sad. Every adult is failing them, and it's being allowed on a world stage. There's been suggestions of raising the age for competition, raising the age for the Olympics in general, not only to discourage the quad trend, but the abuse that the girls are put through by coaches like Eteri needs to stop being the norm. This is just a big, just sad and tragic thing, all during the most controversial and depressing Olympic Games ever. I don't have much more to say about it. I wish I did but there isn't really a happy note to land on. All I can say is that I hope that in four years, things might be a little bit different.